Greetings, stranger, and welcome to Eastgate, the greenest part of Absalom. In contrast to its more affluent yet less egalitarian opposite, the population here prides itself on its communal spirit and harmonious way of living. Being the largest of the city's districts by area, Eastgate is home to a plurality of Absalom's middle classes. In contrast to the constant buzz of the Ivy District or the density of notable locations in the docks, life here takes a calmer, more mellow pace, which is just how the locals prefer it. Even a cursory glance at a map will show you how seriously the Eastgaters take their obligations to their natural spaces, though this has accompanied a degree of neglect to the problems faced by its more sentient inhabitants on occasion. The sun is beginning its daily climb, so we should get going. Hop onto the carriage, and I will take you on a tour of this unique, yet surprisingly unknown area of the city at the centre of the world. My route will take us southwards, at first into the residential heart of the district, before turning sharply eastwards into its many parks and reserves. As we meander our way through towards the precipice quarter, I would invite you to note the incredible discrepancy between bustling streets and near silent parks. You see, Eastgate remains the only area of the city where the majority of its population travels extensively to work, frequently by rickshaw or carriage. Given that we will be entering the main roads just as the day begins, don't be surprised if we are surrounded by the hustle and bustle of the locals for a while. But fear not, for that will quickly fade away to leave Eastgate strangely empty. This is, I think, the only part of Absalom whose population fluctuates notably during the working day. So, are you ready to get underway? Excellent. Let's begin. Now, as we are entering the district from the north, leaving the wealthy Petal district in our wake, it should come as no surprise to you that these initial homesteads are on the side of affluence. Indeed, almost immediately on our left, can you see the largest private estate in Eastgate? That is Mercerine Manor. Its occupant is Scion Lord Hyman Hoof, the head of his tiny noble house and a retired venture captain of the Pathfinder Society. He is one of those adventurers whose body aged before his thirst for questing could be satiated, and so in retirement Scion Lord Hoof has become something of a socialite for the society. If you are successful on a particularly interesting venture, it would not be unlikely for you to receive an invitation from him to attend Mercerine Manor, to be wined and dined. In exchange, uh, all you would need to do is be suitably regaling in your stories of the wider world. But don't go thinking that any old dungeon delve would do, though, because the old fighter undertook plenty of travelling before he retired. Indeed, I understand that Cyan Lord Hoof numbers among the foremost experts on Tian Xia for the Pathfinders, and maintains good connections there to this day. He is also the non nomarch low councillor for Eastgate, which hints at his subtle influence. Just beyond Mercerine Manor is Evergreen Park, a pristinely maintained area of permanent springtime that brushes up against the eastern edge of Absalom's walls. Indeed, it is by far the largest district park in the whole city, large enough to boast its own hills and even small lakes. Residing there is one Lady Evergale of House Wickham, whose influence is far less subtle, but just as real as Scion Lord Hoofs. From within the park's serene greenery, previously host only to temporary visitors seeking reprieve from the otherwise overwhelmingly urban landscape of Absalom, Lady Evergale commands a zealously loyal following called the Children of Spring. As a more fundamentalist priestess of Gosray, Lady Evergale advocates for a return to primitivism, relying only on the land's natural abundances. To be fair to the group, they do take their responsibilities to the park seriously, and have ensured its continued growth and maintenance for many years. However, as time has marched onwards, more and more families in Eastgate have lost a member or friend 
to the cleric's curious persuasiveness. The children of spring typically forsake almost all outside communication once inducted. Uh, this has naturally led to a uh, growing concern about the well-being and fates of the group's members as well as the safety of the park, although to my knowledge uh, they have never harmed or hindered a park visitor. However, political efforts at intervention have failed so far, largely because Lady Evergale is actually a member of the Low Council, elected year after year by her green-haired group to one of its so-called at-large positions. And whenever the question of Evergreen Park is brought to the Council's attention, Lady Evergale emerges, her followers in tow. Now, as we approach that impressive waterfall there, Allow me to take a moment to tell you about some of Absalom's recent political history, and I promise it is quite relevant. You see, until a few years ago, Absalom had more districts than it does today, and the district boundaries looked quite different in many places. In something of an upset, the Grand Council decided to revise the city's layout and administration in a rare display of interference in local politics. Here, I dug out this old map to show you, and I think its relevance will become immediately apparent. Two entire districts, the Merchant's Quarter and Green Ridge, were abolished, their councils disbanded, and no marks made redundant. While the former was largely absorbed by the coins, which performed a similar function within Absalom, Green Ridge was sliced up its cultural heart absorbed by Eastgate, while its residential side was split between all of its neighbours. And while we're looking, I should also point out to you how much the Ivy District benefited from this reorganisation. It became an important buffer for two wealthy districts overnight. Uh, still, when people discuss Eastgate's affinity for druids and nature, much of that is a result of this reorganisation thrusting lands formerly within Green Ridge onto the Eastgate Council. Prior to this, Eastgate was almost entirely residential, though it did always have a preference for community and nature. So, while we are touring Eastgate, this northern strip was, until about a decade ago, Green Ridge, and with this awareness come some important cultural notes. For example, take a look at all the farmland that surrounds us. As well as being a point of pride for the locals, uh, supporting interior farmland had historically been an important strategic policy for the High Council. In times of siege, the supplementary food the ridges could provide went a long way to avoid famine for Absalomians. Oh, and I should also tell you that the term ridger is often used pejoratively by people from out of district. It denotes a person lacking willpower or ambition. However, this term was taken with pride by the locals here, who always preferred quiet sustenance to endless growth anyway. Now that you're suitably educated, I can show you this magnificent waterfall that tumbles down from Eridan's hill above. This is the water cleft, and it gives rise to dozens of important freshwater streams that riddle the district. Clean to drink and free to draw from, the water cleft used to be the meeting place of Green Ridge's district council, called the Shaded. Their discussions were always in the open air, promoting transparency with citizens and harmony with nature. These days, the loss of the district has meant that the water cleft's importance has diminished, so more and more estates downstream have successfully petitioned to privatise sections of the network. Locals fear that, uh, in time, uh, the water cleft could become completely privatised. These crossroads are also the most obvious spot for the slow urbanisation of Eastgate, as any farther westwards takes us squarely into housing blocks. Straddling the difference is our next stop, that arresting roof there. Yeah, I know, I know, it looks comically like a one-foot-tall building with a thatched roof, but the large complex is actually located beneath the ground. This is Black Hills, a tavern popular with the district guards and district gossips. 
run by the ever gregarious Deej Blackhill. It is the source of his infamous underbrew, a sort of uh, spiced mead that is popular in Numeria, a dangerous and utterly unique land to the north that I would love to tour around. For now though, visiting Blackhills is probably the safer option. If you were to continue westwards here, you would come to a busy crossroads on whose corner lies a city-famous restaurant called The Turning Leaf. Its premise is similar to that of To Eat the World in Westgate, except that The Turning Leaf prepares a regular menu as well. Rather than accept commissions for bizarre and unique dishes for their own sake, like Samael Rentore does, uh, the owner of this restaurant, a Goran named Kideska, invites professional chefs from across Galarian to present signature dishes on a rotating basis. From the shackles to Tian Xia, dishes are served just like home, with uh, Kideska themselves adopting a role of host rather than cook. This unique business style has proved to be very successful. Tickets during presentation days are costly and coveted. On other days, though, the Turning Leaf's clientele gives way to locals, who enjoy a return to the regular menu. Oh, and I should say that the Goran, in case you were not aware, uh, are a race of sentient plants, originally hailing from Nex. They were created by a legendary druid called Gorus. Intentionally or not is not known. And uh, they liberated themselves from Nex's persecution after teaching themselves sentience. Even in Absalom, the Goran are rare to meet, but Eastgate is a natural environment for them. Ah, now this manor turned shop on our left is the most infamous locale in the district. This is Mama Shrog's Solutions. But this is not a business consultancy, as the name could imply, but rather a curiosity store that houses uh, somewhere within it the solution to any personal problem, or so the slight, pale Mama Shrog claims. Prior to her purchase of the manor some years ago, it was privately owned by an artist called Vesneri, over the course of many years, he descended into madness in pursuit of, quote, the perfect shade of blood red, and ultimately murdered his family there, using their blood to paint several landscape pieces of a place he called the Flayed Lands. They found him staring wistfully at the final canvas, the blood paint still glistening. So, after such a troubled past, it was hoped by many that its new owner would mend Visneri House's reputation, but unfortunately, the otherwise enigmatic Mama Shrog is vocal about only one thing, her worship of Lamashtu, the mother of demons and goddess of nightmares. The city at the centre of the world is famous for its laws on religious tolerance, so it is not illegal to worship such a deity or to display a shrine in her honour, as Mama Shrog is proud to do. However, this has inspired a series of assaults on her store from different organisations, usually the firebrands or clerics of opposing deities. Each of them has ended violently for the assailants at the hands of a demon or twelve, conjured by Mama Shrog, and she has so far successfully argued that this constituted self-defence under the law. Nevertheless, her curiosity shop remains the most controversial point of interest in Eastgate, and if you do want to peruse its items, it might be best to do so incognito. Ah, but enough horror stories for now. Look past Visneri House and admire the tallest structure in the city, second only to Absalom's lighthouse in the Flotsam Graveyard. This is simply called the Watchtower, and it is the pride of the Green Ridge neighbourhood. I hardly need to tell you how impressive it is, standing there at 520 feet tall and being visible from almost anywhere in Absalom. From its top, you are able to see not only the outlying neighbourhoods like Copperwood and Dornfoot, but also much farther afield into the Cairnlands and even to the edges of the Immenwood. 
Despite this scope, though, uh, a lot of the garrison's time is spent surveying the city itself for any sign of fire or other serious threat. The manning of the watchtower is undertaken by a small detachment of the First Guard, called the Eagle Garrison. Their role, as the name suggests, is uh, to scout for threats to the city as a whole, rather than police individuals or monitor minor crimes. Back when Green Ridge was its own polity, the Eagle Garrison did double as its district guard, just as the Kortos Cavalry doubles as the West Gate's uh, Sally Guard. However, these days the garrison is confined to the Watchtower and the lands just beyond the wall. Perhaps because of this reduction in jurisdiction, some of the Eagle Garrison's junior officers have in recent years begun to spread rumours about a vast, sprawling underground fortress hidden beneath the Watchtower. Each tale differs from the next. Reports range from a labyrinth to a series of laboratories where clandestine and unspeakable experiments are conducted. However, I am confident in concluding that these are nonsensical stories spun by bored soldiers. Still, never underestimate the extent and influence of the very real Undercity that runs beneath all Absalom, because you never know when a denizen will pay you a visit in the night. Well, we're beginning to leave the Green Ridge neighbourhood and enter into Eastgate proper, as it were. Uh, the first point of note here is this rather plain-looking red brick building that flanks us to our right. This is the headquarters of the Concerned Residents Union, which functions as a kind of unofficial second district council here. Presided over by the influential Gelder Delby, the union is usually a harmless enough display of local politics in action. Members find a voice through this assembly to express their reservations or support for any particular project or proposal and this in turn is passed on to the official Eastgate Council, led by Nomark and Captain of the District Post Guard, Lord Ayunga of House Akesh. Despite holding no official power, the Concerned Residents Union does boast an almost unrivaled degree of influence within Eastgate. In many ways, the Eastgate Council is just a group that rubber stamps decisions taken in this building. Now, for the longest time, this was not really a problem because, after all, this process was a legitimately democratic way for the people of Eastgate to express themselves. Um, ever since the integration of the former Green Ridge district, though, tensions have fled. The Union has become increasingly hostile to both the Children of Spring and the Circle of Stones, a druidic order that previously dominated the Green Ridge Council. This has not escalated to violence, or even threats of violence, just yet, but the more moderate heads are growing wary. It is hoped that Nomark Ayonga, uh, ever the confidant of the acting Primarch and other senior politicians in Absalom, is able to keep the situation from escalating any further. On a happier note, there is on the other side of this block an academy of learning for linguistically gifted children. Known as the Endiron School, it is renowned for producing first-rate diplomats. Indeed, it is not uncommon for the wealthy all over the city to jostle with each other for the chance to send their children here first, before they enrol in better-known academies in the Wise Quarter or Ivy District. The curriculum is tough, demanding that pupils be fluent in at least three languages before they are passed. But the teachers are fair, and satisfaction from parents and children alike is quite high. The next block is owned entirely by Yargos Gil, Absalom's foremost military historian. His name may be familiar to you if you recall my Puddles tour. He funds the mission there out of a sense of duty and respect to his home district. These days, though, he passes the time in the enormous library he hosts inside this estate. I understand that the first two floors are filled with nothing but bookshelves and tomes detailing strategy and history, while the top floor's personal quarters are surprisingly modest for a wealthy man. Ever a friend to the Pathfinder Society, members are given free access to the collection and Yargoth's knowledge and experiences. 
Strangers are given access too, but they are charged a modest but still quite real fee, which is increased if they wish to consult with Yargos himself. Many visitors indeed find the librarian more interesting than the library, because he was an active and successful participant in the People's Revolt of 4669 that led to the independence of Andorran, a nation fiercely opposed to nobility and monarchy to the north. Just behind this estate, and uh, down the road to the west, lies Eastgate Hall, the district council's headquarters. Notice how close it is to the concerned residence union building? Well, the Nomarch has kept a steady hand on the Eastgate tiller for many years now, and seems likely to for many more, because Lord Iunga maintains a strong relationship with the High Council. Although this is not too unusual for a senior politician, it is not necessarily too usual either. That is to say, that um, district nomarchs are normally able to run their territory with unrivaled abandon if they so choose, for example like Hygen Topkick does for the Puddles. Thus, it is the perfect position to occupy for someone seeking power who is nevertheless unconcerned with the Shadow War. Yet despite this possibility, Nomarch Lord Ayunga is an excellent politician, being subtle yet strong, and moderate yet respected. I have confidence in his ability to keep Eastgate off everyone's radar for many years to come. No, if Eastgate has a weakness, I would argue that it lies instead in its judiciary, which has a well-earned reputation for leniency that borders on disrespect for justice. Now, don't get me wrong, I would be the last person to advocate for an overzealous, farcical legal system, but in Eastgate's case, I think the pendulum may have swung a touch too far the other way. I mention this because the Eastgate District Courthouse lies just beyond the council hall there, and in recent years some wily lawyers from the Court of the Black Paper have managed to get important cases transferred into the Eastgate circuit. As a consequence, some quite serious crimes prime suspects have been found not guilty. Naturally, we all respect the impartiality of the jurists and the non-guilt of the defendants, but concern is growing from other district circuits that Absalom's overall jurisprudence could be compromised if one circuit stands out as too difficult for the prosecution. While we're looking in that direction, notice the ruined clock tower there, sticking out above the surrounding buildings. It is called the Broken Bastion, and it is the eighth tallest structure in the city. Believe it or not, it was destroyed around 300 years ago when a dragon ravaged parts of Absalom, but the locals have always refused to repair it, claiming that it adds to the history and charm of Eastgate. Personally, I think it might be due to a healthy sense of fear, because prior to its destruction, it was the home to a group of obsessive mages determined to unlock the secrets of time itself. Minor but consistent distortions are reported in and around the site, and people are always worried that um, interfering with the foundations of the bastion, which would be necessary to facilitate major repairs, could unleash a devastating temporal calamity onto Absalom. However, fears were alleviated somewhat after the site was purchased and refurbished by the city's fourth spell lord, Moir Galthfallow. The fourth spell lord is not a councillor, but rather a senior magicrat charged with protecting the city's magical secrets and eliminating any threats born from artifacts or ancient curses made manifest, etc. etc. As you can imagine, the tiefling is quite a busy man. Apparently, his mind is increasingly occupied by a mysterious, hermetically sealed and deadlocked vault in the bastion that has been slowly unlocking on its own for the past few hundred years. It has taken so long, some claim, because the lock and its contents are under a time seal as well that keeps slipping, though I do not know the truth of that particular idea. But now we come to the most famous location in all of Eastgate, though formerly part of Green Ridge. Take a look to our left. This is a park unlike any other in the city, perhaps in the world. 
Do you notice how the ground has buckled and split with roots thicker than the camel driving us? Well, that's because this entire area, representing more than 5% of the whole district, belongs to a single fig tree. You can see it quite clearly over there, right in the middle. That is the Grand Halt. It is one of the few things in the city at the centre of the world that is possibly older than it. The story claims that the god Eridan rested on the Isle of Kortos following his raising of it from beneath the waves. Having expended so much divine power in the process, the fledgling god took nourishment from the Grand Halt, then only a sapling, and being the only thing that was growing on the island at the time. Grateful, he blessed the tree, which has grown strong and healthy ever since. Now, almost 5,000 years later, it is composed of no fewer than 17 wide trunks and innumerable branches that are never pruned, spread out across its park in sacred recognition of Eridan's blessing. The veracity of this story is not entirely clear to me. I do not know of any fig trees that sprout deep underwater, nor why or how Eridan would take nourishment from a single sapling. But still, you would be wise not to question its authenticity here in Eastgate. And besides, the tree is nearly as old as the stories claim for sure. And uh, if it is a natural occurrence, then well, I find it all the more impressive. The Grand Holt is maintained by a dedicated druid circle called the Circle of Stones that I had previously mentioned. They are led by a man named Korhul, also known as the Horned Man, who is an enigmatic figure of many hats. Before the district's reorganisation, the Horned Man was the nomarch of Green Ridge, and the loss of this status has only intensified the jealousy with which he protects the tree, or, specifically, the Dryad Queen who lives within it. Yes, that's right. Despite this area being hemmed in on all sides by urban landscape, and despite containing only a single tree, as mighty as it may be, the Grand Holt is still impressive enough to have attracted Queen Iolanthe to Absalom, where she has dwelled since before the elves returned to Galarian. Ah, now on the corner of this block is another of the district's most preeminent schools, located in this impressively tall fortress-turned-academy. This is the Talavant School, the premier location for an education in comparative politics in Galarian. The keep itself was constructed in the city's early history as a military installation, but became defunct as Absalom expanded. After a period of disuse, it was finally acquired by the idealistic philosophers of the school, who appreciated the ability to wax lyrical about strong leadership whilst gesturing vaguely at the entire city from on high. Their hope was to educate Eastgaters specifically in the art of comparative politics, which they chose as the subject most worthy of study for reasons best known to themselves. These days, though, the school is suffering from its own success. Its reputation for excellence has led to wealthier pupils outbidding for class spaces, as well as those occupied by the children of foreign diplomats who safely study their own governmental systems without bias from within Absalom. Thus, only around one in four pupils are Eastgaters. Nevertheless, the building remains a point of pride for the locals, as it is the seventh tallest in the city. If you travel down this same road, all the way to the wall, you would reach the Poston Gate, usually referred to simply as the Poston. Of all the main entrances into Absalom, the Poston is the smallest, though it still stands around 50 feet tall. Casual visitors to the city will not find entry here. It is kept locked by default, opening only to permit goods or personnel from the Star Watch, whose own headquarters can be reached nearby, to pass through. The most notable thing about the Poston, therefore, is the Post Guard itself, who protect it and the district. In Absalom's earliest days, this gate came under attack the most frequently during times of siege, and in 1298, forces led by a group calling themselves the Prophet Kings breached it. The Post Guard managed to repel the assault before it had breached the inner gate, however, and today, a stone marking the deepest point reached by the attackers is engraved with the phrase, 
and no farther. Now the motto of the Post Guard. If you're looking for an exotic pet in Absalom, I would recommend visiting a shop in the block behind us. It's called Berigel's Fur and Feathers, and its proprietor, Berigel Tindertails, is happy to deal in anything that is not sentient, sapient, endangered, or dangerous. Of course, some of these are difficult to measure, and the gnome has been known to run uh, afoul of the circle of stones on a few occasions when her purse has won over her head or her heart. But in general, everything is kept above board. Now, as we turn our backs to the Grand Halt and begin our final road southwards towards the Precipice Quarter, notice this windowless oak building on our left. This is Antler Lodge, a temple to Erastil, the god of the hunt and of farming. It is run by High Priestess Lois Zappa, but she normally insists on being called only Grandmother. Antler Lodge was built without windows so that those who visit might be spared the ugly sight of urbanization. Uh, where you would expect to find a view into the outside world, you are instead greeted by meticulously crafted illusions that replicate scenic landscapes, homely hearths, and other spectacles worthy of a woodland retreat. However, Antler Lodge has lately been wrestling with what I can only describe as infected illusions, a cottage that is suddenly on fire, or a scream heard in the night. The source is unclear, but Grandmother is determined to resolve the issue before it becomes better known. So do me a favour and do not mention this to anyone else quite yet. This block coming up on our right might look poor and wretched to your eyes, but remember that looks can be deceiving. This assemblage of tents, shacks, lean-tos and muddy tracks is Giltown the home to Absalom's largest population of Azakertes. You might remember my description of them from my docks tour, but suffice it to say that they are an ancient and proud, if often tragically distrusted, ancestry of amphibious humanoids. Their presence here facilitates an enormous trade network that handles any and all goods touching the sea on their journeys, and that is more or less everything that comes into Absalom. Sunken cargo is theirs to claim, alongside many artefacts that mages find helpful for working with uh, water elemental magics, for example. Now, the obvious question then is, why does Giltown look so dilapidated? Well, what most people fail to appreciate is that this represents just the tip of the iceberg. While they would never admit it, those in the know would be able to tell you that this block disguises several entrances to a vast, underground, and indeed mostly underwater, series of caverns that riddle the island like a sponge. We are technically standing on a meteorite, after all, and one that spent over 5,000 years completely submerged in the inner sea. These caverns host their own communities of Azakerti, who prefer living in or right next to the water, and thus, this area is the poorest neighbourhood of that community relegated to living in sight of us surface dwellers. Moreover, I suspect the traders like to embellish the block with litter and mud to make it less appealing to us so that we do not disturb their quotidian lives below. Now, I have saved the best two stops for last. Here is the first. Behold the mighty blue tower the tallest structure within the city walls that is independent from them. It reaches hundreds of feet into the air, and its unicorn horn design is capped with a fully functioning lighthouse that can focus its beam so precisely that it is capable of illuminating an individual ship well beyond the extent of the harbour. The tower was built during a period dominated by a Talden faction called the Blue Lords, who pioneered the architectural tradition of building ever taller structures to demonstrate authority. While it does not count in the official recording of building heights, uh, the Blue Lords also extended the height of their tower by carving out massive caverns beneath it and filling them with villages and farms capable of surviving without sunlight as a last refuge against attack. 
And when I say massive, I mean the size of eight entire city blocks massive. I cannot stress how wealthy and powerful the Blue Lords were at the height of their power here in the city. Nevertheless, their influence eventually waned and then collapsed abruptly following a series of destructive earthquakes in 2920. The Blue Lords fled the city for their native Taldor, and the tower they left behind has been mostly abandoned ever since. I say mostly because the site is so absurdly large and extensive that several factions have been known to occupy it at once. Currently, uh, to my knowledge anyway, there are two, the official one and the unofficial one. Officially, the Blue Tower now serves as the headquarters for the world-famous messenger corps known as the Winged Sandals, a religious organisation dedicated to Iomedai, the goddess of honour and valour. The Sandals are experts at communicating information, especially information that is not trusted with magical transmission. As well as serving as the city's postal service, their experts can also be hired to deliver letters and missives to all corners of Galarian, although costs begin to rise sharply as soon as the destination lies beyond Absalom's borders. Their reputation is excellent, but it risks being blemished in the near future by the other faction occupying the Blue Tower, the Taldoran government. At least its Grand Ambassador to Absalom, Talara Alvatin, with her impressive corps of spies. As ruthless as she is efficient, you would do well to restrict knowledge of this to yourself and your closest paragons, because there is not a thing Grand Ambassador Tolara would not do for her country. And, as she also holds the ancient seat of Taldor on the Low Council, she has the means to enforce her judgments. And finally, let me conclude this tour of Eastgate by giving way to one of the most peculiar blocks in the whole city, the Wonder Vale. Architectural styles from across the world mingle here side by side, from Nexian wizard towers to Tian Dan pagodas, all erected, believe it or not, just over a hundred years ago, following the death of Eridan. You see, the city at the centre of the world's status was immediately and existentially challenged at the beginning of the Age of Lost Omens. The loss of Eridan was felt most keenly here, in the city he had founded, and every inhabitant felt the confusion and vulnerability most keenly. To assuage this tragedy, the Grand Council decided to utilise the previously undeveloped tract of land uh, to host a one-of-a-kind festival. Lasting for months, this Wonder Vale saw the union of all of humanity's achievements presented together, all commissioned from some of Absalom's most notable and accomplished craftsmen, mages, and labourers. The Wonder Vale attracted visitors from across Galarian, and is credited by many historians with ensuring the city's security through the expansion of soft power in a famously difficult time period. It was an unparalleled success. However, with their objective achieved, the Grand Council then ignored the Wonder Vale, and an irritated Eastgate Council decided to simply leave it be, letting the variety of exotic plants and animals imported for the festival roam as they liked within the block. This return-to-nature approach has given rise to uh, a quite unique ecology, with bats in particular flourishing in the tops of the towers. So, if you hear a local refer to the Vampire Towers, they mean the Wonder Vale. It would be a worthy expedition in itself to attempt to document the flora and fauna of communities here, I should think. Young couples and tourists are known to follow the main road through the block, but the druids advise against straying beyond. Not every display of humanity is safe for the unprepared, after all. Who knows? what could be lurking in this eclectic mix of buildings now. Well, it is fitting that we have finished right next to the Precipice Quarter, which is the most famous part of the city for would-be adventurers. I hope you have enjoyed my tour around Eastgate and the former Green Ridge. It lasted a, a little bit longer than I had expected, but then it is a remarkable and storied part of Absalom. 
you would do well to familiarise yourself with its pathways and roads before wandering off on your own, but if you do get lost, remember to use the Blue Tower, Watchtower and Talavant School Keep as uh, orientation guides. Between them, you should never lose your way too egregiously. As you can probably imagine, I will be touring the Precipice Quarter next, but I will need an hour or so to prepare. The history of this place is, um, well, tortured in many ways, despite recent efforts by acting Primarch Starborn to reclaim it. There was a festival held here in recent years that disrupted its trajectory quite a bit, but overall for the better, I must say. It would be my pleasure to tell you more, so meet me back here in a little bit and uh, we will get underway. Well, until then.